everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Baltazar. And welcome to the review of the UT Martin game. And well, we have a lot of thoughts, uh, perhaps not as many negative thoughts as have been pushed out there into the world, but we're also coming off of an all-time classic uh, ESPN classic game in LSU USC. We waited until that game was over, and I do not regret that decision at all. <laughs> but yeah, that was, was a good game. <laughs> fantastic game uh, yeah. that just happened there. But before we dive into the review, we do want to thank the sponsors of today's show. That is Greg Arthur and Grandma. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Grandma. And if you want to have your name read out at the beginning of every episode and support the show, please be sure to check out the official supporters link found in our podcast and Twitter bio. But let's go ahead and dive straight into the Tennessee Martin review. It was a 41-6 to Wildcat victory. So another really, really good defensive performance. I think, honestly, it split the difference between you and I's score prediction. <laughs> yeah, we were both in the neighborhood. Because I think we pretty much just looked at the last few FCS games to start the year for us and said it's probably going to be around that. And it was. That was pretty much about where we ended up because I think I was thinking like 49-7, somewhere around there. And you, I know, had – I can't remember what your K-State score prediction was, but I know you had nine points for UT Martin. And I thought there was a moment where you were actually going to end up getting that, like on the (laughs) bottom. Like, like there's a, there's a chance there for a bit where you were going to be a right on the money. Yeah. But it wasn't meant to be. I mean, just sort of starting from the top level, I, I suppose we'll start with the more general good. It was another sellout for K state. So, you know, the environment was pretty good. Um, So that that's always nice to open the season with a sellout. And of course the defense played really, really well. And I have a feeling we're going to dive into this whenever we get into game day grades a little bit more, but my number one takeaway up to this point, at least from K state Twitter is that everyone really needs to eat a Snickers and just relax. Like this was a game against an FCS school, a 19 year old's first start in his home environment in the state he grew up where he's praised as being the hero. I mean, yeah, there are going to be nerves. There's going to be rust with how many new pieces there are, as well as, you know, naturally someone's going to be nervous. So what I took away was there was nothing that went wrong that couldn't pretty easily be fixed. And honestly, towards the back end, it kind of was (laughs) fixed for the most part. But yeah, I, my biggest takeaway is just everyone really needs to relax. The offense isn't broken. Avery doesn't suck. We're going to be fine. At least you can't draw the conclusion that we're not going to be based off of this game. Yeah, I I do think that there's been um, maybe people a little too anxious uh, to um, lose their minds over this game. Uh, the first half wasn't very good on offense. Uh, like that's just indisputable. Like it was subpar and Avery had a pretty bad half uh, for the most part. Uh, but his second half, well, his third quarter really uh, was much better. And uh, I, I was pretty happy with how he played there. Uh, he seemed a bit more comfortable. It seemed like we, uh, met him in the middle a little bit, at least it seems like on the designed runs. Cause I know that there's been a desire to not run him that much, uh, but uh, we got him a few designed runs just to get some yards and get him comfortable. And that seemed to kind of do the trick a little bit. Uh, so he still doesn't grade out very well in this game for me, but his second half was just leaps and bounds better uh, than his first. Cause his first was just, it was kind of bad. It was pretty bad. Uh, but if you take Avery out of the equation, this was a fantastic game, uh, pretty much up and down for almost every single position group. So particularly the defense I thought was just phenomenal. Uh, so I, I don't really have many, if any complaints 
that again you put it well most of the things that you can complain about are things that uh i think can be fixed uh, pretty easily like there's not any i think glaring uh issues that came out of this game where i'm looking at that and saying like this is going to hold us back the entire season yeah and i will get worried if it like especially if some of the worst parts of like the game sort of persists more in the two lane or if it gets worse in the two lane but i'm not going to hit the panic button after one game and i think people that are doing that like i said they just maybe they need a trip to cabo or something because it's it's a little it's a little much it's a little much but do you want to get into game day grades or do you have anything else to say before we get into that um just uh, a really good environment, particularly, I think, uh, the um, early stages of the game. That's kind of how these season openers generally go, I feel like. Uh, just because we know it's an FCS opponent uh, and uh, there's a, like it, things are pretty overmatched. Uh, so I, um, the environment was pretty good, um, particularly to begin. Um, dwindled off a little bit. I, I generally don't get too annoyed by that and fcs games like sure if it's like a big game at some point then yeah but uh, otherwise well attended like people seemed really into it uh, and it was great to have football season back so uh, after tons of anticipation we're already one weekend yeah so now we'll get into game day grades where we go through every single position group including the coordinators and give them a grade from a plus to f a plus meaning they near single handedly made won us the game or made very few mistakes. F minus meaning they single handedly lost us the game. Uh, we didn't lose, so there's no Fs this week. <laughs> but and uh, no one even really got close. So we'll start off with the one that everyone is going to talk about and probably where the bulk of our time is going to be spent, and that is with the quarterback with Avery Johnson and. I guess you can rope Jacob Knuth and take Juan Roberson into this, but it's mostly Avery Johnson. Avery ended up 14 of 21, 153 yards, two touchdowns and a pick. And I will say that the pick reminded me a lot of Will's first two interceptions last year, where it was a seam ball, where it was the right decision. It was just the wrong throw he needs to put a little more air under that ball. And then it's a touchdown to DJ. So to the right decision in that moment was pretty encouraging. And I didn't feel like his accuracy was all that bad, but where I, I took, I think the biggest issue that I had, especially in the first half was he was, he was kind of playing. He wasn't breathing basically is the best way to put it he was sort of getting caught up in the moment and he was missing reads because of it. There are a few game, There are a few in particular that I'm thinking of. One was Keegan Johnson coming off of a switch dig or a switch dagger concept. I'd have to look at it again to figure out which one it actually was, but Keegan Johnson was wide open coming out of his break and Avery just takes the check down instead, which, you know, stuff like that, it, it happens on occasion, but it, it was kind of one of those plays that was like, yeah, KJ is your read here. <laughs> it, it was it was one of those situations. And then there was another one where Jace was open for what would have been a touchdown on a little seam post up the middle, basically like a little slice route, looking trying to split the safeties. And again, Avery just just misses him. He doesn't see him because he's you know he's trying to work himself too quickly. And I think in a way that you kind of expect that those growing pains and that this is where I, I sort of, I, you sort of have to expect this from a true sophomore in his second all time start in his first home start. There's going to be nerves. The game is going to be going pretty fast for him. Does that mean he's bad? Does that mean he's cooked? No. It just means that he doesn't have the experience that other quarterbacks have. And so I ended up giving him a C plus for the game 
the Jace Brown throw was really, really nice, and that bumped him up a, basically an entire plus for me. But those missed reads are a little much for me to really give him anything better than that. Yeah, I uh, was much happier with the second half. He looked more comfortable. Uh, he was a little bit more decisive. But, yeah, the uh, uh, overthinking some pretty open receivers uh, and then kind of I think that throw to DJ is an overcorrection on that issue. I think that uh, he was coached to be more decisive. And, you know, if you see an open guy make the throw, and I think he sees DJ and instead of – uh, taking the time to uh, make the touch pass. He uh, just sped himself up too much. Uh, so like you said, some of that's an experience. Uh, it's a little frustrating uh, given just, you know, like how high the expectations are. So like a, a reason to be, you know, he's kind of going to be good, but he's kind of going to be graded on a curve, unfortunately, because his expectations are just through the roof. I gave him a C minus. Uh, I, I won't say though that that's me like thinking that's indicative of the future because uh, I was still pretty happy with how he played in the bowl game and uh, when he played in the regular season last year, uh, I thought that it was encouraging. Um, I think like we've said it a lot already, but um, most of his problems from this game very very fixable. Uh, so I'm not super worried about Avery long term, but. Uh, for first game of the year, this wasn't very great, uh, but he can he could increase his grade very easily. I guess that's all I'll put it. Yeah, and that's sort of the the be- the most encouraging part is there. There's a pretty clear path for him to get better and get better grade next week. So that that's the Avery Johnson conversation, and trust me, there's you'll see a lot more of the Avery Johnson conversation in the next. Five, five days from when this releases. Yeah. But now we can move on to undoubtedly a bright spot, and that is the K-State running back room. DJ goes for one of the quietest 13-124s I've ever seen. Joe Jackson makes an appearance, 7 of 48. Dylan Edwards, 5 of 43 and a touchdown. Then Jimmy White, LeJames, gets one rush for 12 yards and a touchdown. I have literally no complaints. It's an A+. plus. Yeah, A-plus for me as well. This was a very easy A-plus. DJ was fantastic in this one game where I thought we might uh, not see as much of him because uh, there were just whispers about him uh, being like 90 or 95% out of 100, so you think maybe they pulled off a little. Uh, but no, he ends up going for yet another 100-plus yard game. Uh, he had a 48 yard run uh, either the tail end of the third or very beginning of the fourth. And uh, I was generally great. Dylan Edwards only five carries, but he made the most of them. He got a, a touchdown after that uh, Jace Brown catch and had a couple of really explosive runs uh, where the speed was very apparent. There were a couple of those where he really was like, one block or like one like shoestring tackle away from like breaking off a massive touchdown. Joe Jackson looked really good. And then when James White got uh, an actually pretty good touchdown run there at the end of the game uh, for the final scores, this is a very, very, very easy a plus Uh, running backs have been very consistent over the course of the show. And this is yet another example of that. I think we're going to have a really fun season in this room uh, in particular. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, a easy A plus doesn't mean it just means we don't really have a lot to say. So moving on to the receivers room, Jace Brown went five for 71, just barely missing a touchdown, but I think it was what, like two yards. <laughs> uh, I think it was just a yard, one yard short. It's an evil world out there. Uh, Trace Bivey two for 26, Andre Davis one for nine and KJ one for six. And it, this is one that, you know, because of the quarterback play, it does get more difficult to grade. Um, it, it got so difficult to grade that I actually, the Jace Brown fumble knocked it down <laughs> to grade in the return game. But the receivers were pretty consistently getting open with one exception of Dante Cephas, which is pretty concerning. 
but he also was drawing O'Shea Baker a lot more than I really thought he would. So, you know, that's, that's a tough draw, but all in all, there weren't any really bad drops. They were getting open. They just weren't getting the ball. And that's, it's a tough, it's an evil world out there. So this is a very evil world that they have to get a B with to me. Yeah, I gave him a B minus for pretty similar reasons. Just uh, like overall kind of lack of production. Uh, Jace, uh, I mean, five for 71. I mean, like that's on a stat line that I, I'm hoping is kind of like his uh, median. Um, I'm hoping that's what he's uh, getting per game. I was, I was really pleased with that. And he probably should have had a few more catches as well, honestly. Uh, Trace Bybee had two catches. I, I was very happy about that, including one in time that actually mattered. Uh, so uh, he's already doubled his reception count from last year. Um, I was very happy with uh, his reception. Uh, then, um, yeah, Davis, Andre Davis gets a catch as well, which I was not uh, really expecting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this was a solid performance. Uh, they had generally pretty decent uh run blocking as well i felt uh but yeah just not enough sample size really with these guys at jaden jackson i guess he had a a patented jaden jackson jet sweep um and he took that nine yards so that was pretty effective um i'm hoping uh, that we get a little bit more effective uh in the coming weeks uh, because um, I'd like to to see a bit more production out of him. Cephas, I was a little disappointed to not really get anything out of him this week, uh, but we'll I'll, I'll still kind of wait and see on that because I know that this just wasn't the best week for the passing game overall. Yeah. Next up is tight ends, fullbacks, and I know it broke Connor's heart a little bit that Garrett Oakley didn't register on. You know, as as we all predicted, <laughs> as we all predicted, Braden Lofton, first touchdown of the year. He goes two for 29. I Again, this is going to, it's one of those situations where you kind of have to grade on a curve because the passing game was just all right. I ended up giving them an A minus, mostly because when they were given the opportunity, i.e. Braden Lofton's two catches, they were pretty effective with it. And you know, they ran block pretty well as well, especially Will Swanson. Will Swanson had a very good game run blocking, but I, I gave them an A minus. Yeah. Um, I gave them an A minus as well. Uh, it's pretty similar reasons. Lofton, he actually graded out the highest of anybody on PFF. He got a 93.8 uh, grade on PFF for this game. Um, a lot of that, I think, comes from the fact that he ran two routes and both of them were receptions. One of them was a touchdown. The other was a hard five first down. So I think it, I think the uh, um, lack of sample size is doing some pretty heavy lifting there. Uh, <laughs> but still a uh, surprisingly good day for um, a tight end that I guess kind of flew under the radar for most of this offseason. Uh, Garrett Oakley um, only got one target, as I recall. Uh, so it will like to see him get a bit more involved. Swanson was fine. Then we saw um, Will Anciao, Andrew Sonner, and Andrew Metzger uh, get some snaps late. And those were all garbage time, but uh, they really all blocked well. Um, Oakley could have been a bit better, I think, as a run blocker. We do know that's just not really what he's going to be asked to do most of the time. That's more Will Swanson's job. Uh, but Will Swanson was really effective there. So I was generally pretty happy with how the tight ends played, even though uh, they didn't get super involved in the pass game. That may be something that, unfortunately, we may have to get a little bit more used to this year because uh, there's not a Ben Sennett in this room. Uh, I'd really like to see Garrett Oakley break out uh, and become that guy, but it may be something where it just takes a couple games to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the tight ends will end up being fine. I think this was just one of those situations where, you know, they weren't the game planned one for. <laughs> but probably the brightest spot on the day on the offense, well, sharing that title with the running backs was the offensive line. This was a game that the offensive line dominated in a way that, I, you know, I expected them to be really good. I did not expect them to play nearly as well as they did. They 
blew every expectation out of the water for me. Kilty was doing excellent in pass protection. Carver has become one of the most complete right tackles in since we started the show, which if you would have told me that in 2020, I would have called you an insane person. But the interior was doing really well. Sam Hecht, you know, wasn't noticeable, which, you know, for – for years, the center has been noticeable and for the wrong reasons. <laughs> so Sam Hecht being unnoticeable, beautiful. This was an A-plus performance for the offensive line. And honestly, if they can if they can keep this pace up, I th- the offensive line will easily get like a wins above replacement of like four <laughs> if we're using that metric. Yeah, I gave him an A-plus too. Uh, I think particularly the pass blocking was absolutely fantastic. I think this was one of the best pass blocking games of the climate era uh, period. Uh, Cause pretty much every offensive lineman um, I thought was uh, genuinely great um, as a uh, pass blocker. I mean, throughout the entire game, we only allowed uh, three um, quarterback pressures. Um, and one of those at uh, was in garbage time uh, by Alex key. Uh, So, but otherwise we only gave up one quarterback hit too. And that was on a long developing pass play that Carver will gave up, which I mean, even then it wasn't a full hit. It was just kind of a bump, but it was enough to take something off the pass. But I mean, we're getting that deep into it. So we're really nitpicking there on pass blocking. I was super happy with that. And run blocking was particularly effective like we saw a lot of last year, the run blocking seemed to get better as the game went on. Cause I think uh, it's a combination of our lines really well conditioned and um, uh, the rotating helps a bit, uh, which again, I know there's mixed feelings on the rotating and I have mixed feelings myself. Um, but that was, I guess one of the main things I want to talk about with the offensive line was there was a series in the second or third quarter where uh, Kilty was not out there at left tackle was John Pastore, uh, which I thought was really interesting because I did not notice that live. Uh, but on rewatch, uh, there was a full series uh, with John Pastore at left tackle. I don't know if it was injury related or they just didn't like something he did on the drive before, uh, but I thought that was super interesting. Uh, I had, was not something I expected from rotation, so that makes me think that it was probably like a very like minor like stinger or something like that. Uh, but other than that, I mean, yeah, this was really excellent um, all across the board. Lane Gang played a lot of snaps. He played at 25, uh, so he was number six uh, in terms of total snaps. Willis, Panzer, and Hecht played um, all the 1A snaps. Kilty missed a few. Uh, Poitier uh, played 30, but then we saw a lot of backups too. Uh, Drake Beckwith, uh, he was playing guard um, for 13 snaps. Michael Capria, uh, he played 13 snaps as well. And then we saw Alex Key, Jackson Fulmer, uh, and John Pastore as well. Uh, so uh, saw the whole second unit of offensive line play. Um, a pretty significant amount of snaps in this one. Or he got a couple of extras as well. Uh, So all in all, super, super, super happy with how the offensive line played this game. Normally we're having a slow start. This was a very fast start for the offensive line. So I hope we can keep that going going to next week. Yeah, because that was was an excellent performance. And – As a change up from the last few years, we are going to keep the coordinators grouped with their respective sides. So this will be the grading of Connor Riley. And I've been harboring for for quite some time that I, I don't think I've articulated at least outright on an episode before, but Connor knows I have had for six far longer than that, like eight months now. Uh, I was not a fan of the Connor Riley hire. Hand in the air, I hated it. (laughs) So I went into this game with very, very, very low expectations. 
I expected it to be one of the most aggressively okay called football games that I have ever seen. And I left the stadium pleasantly surprised. In fact, I was quite pleasantly surprised because there were things that Connor Riley and I imagine with the help of Matt Wells had implemented, like the jet motion that everyone has stolen from Mike McDaniel in the NFL, but also a little bit more in the running game and expanding upon that. But the most important thing to me was how are the passing concepts developing? And they've developed really, really well. People were getting open, like I said, and that was something that I think was sort of lacking in the Klein era, especially last year. Don't get me wrong. Klein was a really good play caller last year, but he wasn't the greatest in terms of scheming guys open, especially against like zone coverages. This was a very, very big highlight for this game up against UT Martin. Now, was Connor Riley perfect? No, and I kind of wish that he started switching a little bit more to RPO to get Avery into that better rhythm to say like, okay, yeah, I can do this, which he started doing a little bit more in the second half, but that's something you need to do really early, especially with a young quarterback. You need to sort of get him okay, easy throw, slant window, slant hitch, you know, a little bubble screen here and there. You need to get that out of the way really early. But all in all, for a relatively vanilla game plan that was implemented, he still showed enough to me to get a B plus, which I was fully ready to go into this game, like giving him a C. (laughs) I gave him a pretty similar grade to you. I gave him an A minus. I was really happy with how he called this game. Uh, first half was rough, uh, but um, also I don't think much of, I don't think a ton of it was his fault. I uh, think because, like you said, he, guys were getting open. Avery just wasn't seeing him. Now we can talk about uh, the offense coordinator's role in that. At that point, we're only speculating like how much of an issue it is with their communication where Avery isn't seeing the open guys or some pulling the trigger on the open guys. I, I have no idea. I am, I'm not a practice, so I don't know. But uh, the, the main ding that I give Riley is I really think Dylan Edwards needed more than 11 snaps in this game. I I think that was borderline coaching malpractice. Especially because uh, with seven touches, he scored twice. Yeah, he's, yes. Uh, scored twice on his seven touches, and he – uh, was averaging uh, about nine yards per touch. Um, it seems he had those two catches for 19 yards, nine and a half per, then five carries for 43 yards, eight and a half, uh, which again, that average on the carries is brought down significantly because his last carry was like a one yard touchdown run. So uh, up until that point, he was getting like 10 yard chunks like every single time. So uh, I, I get it. DJ Giddens like, had a great game. Like he averaged nine and a half yards himself. Like we were averaging nine yards per rush in this game. So like, which is absurd. Um, Avery Johnson was never sacked. He was only touched once the entire game. So like, really good. Uh, but, you know, we've got weapons. It's clear we know that. It's clear we know that with the rotation at receiver. Uh, Trey Spivey was getting uh, the ball in his hands and he made a couple guys miss. Uh, Jace Brown, uh, we were throwing at him a lot. Keegan Johnson got open plenty. We need to throw at him more. We got DJ Giddens three catches. He didn't do a lot, but he's kind of a weapon in the past game that we've been utilizing. So that brings me back to Dylan Edwards. We know we have that weapon. We just need to give him more touches. I think getting him from seven, to, if we get him like five more a game, I'm pretty happy with that on average, I'd say. Uh, so. Um, and again, also, this was kind of a game where this is something we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but um, this was a very slow paced game, courtesy of UT Martin. Uh, they really were trying to play keep away. Like, we only had 50 offensive snaps in this game, and we only had uh, 57 defensive snaps in this game. So, uh, our, our pace was a little bit slower in this one, I think, than we got used to the last couple of years. So, nowhere near as many snaps. Uh, we're had in this game was maybe we'll see in other games going forward. 
Uh, so that's another consideration to make. Yeah, Dylan only touched the ball seven times, but you know maybe if we snap it thirty more times, he touches the ball four more times. So because for for reference, the I think if I'm remembering correctly, the amount the average amount of plays run in an FBS game last year was like 140. Yeah. So we yeah. were short like 30 to 40 snaps. <laughs> yeah, we were short by quite a bit there. So it, it, it was a, um, a, a much slower paced game. Um, and then, of course, we really slowed things down in the second half. And it, also the defense just played really great. So, I mean, there weren't many snaps to be had there anyways because we kept getting stops. Yeah. So now we can move on to the defensive side of the ball, starting with the defensive line. And the only thing that I can really say is Kincaid Dent was in hell for, for the entirety of the time that he had the ball because the pressure was relentless. It came from everywhere, and it didn't really matter who was on the field because the offensive line of UT Martin was getting horribly, horribly bullied. <laughs> and... I, I mean, you have to say the most notable performance of the defensive line is Toby Osinsanmi, who got one and a half sacks by basically just running <laughs> running in a hook line, <laughs> which, oh, okay. And then he hit, by far, my favorite ever K-State sack celebration by just standing there like a statue. And the, the gif of Uso coming up and just cut-checking him by <laughs> slapping him on the back of the head will probably live on as one of my favorite just funny K-State gifts because they're like the Adrian Bow will probably be like my favorite iconic moment gif. But in terms of laughter, I don't think anything will ever top the I like you cut G from Uso Sayamala to reactivate Tobios inside me. But I, this is as easy as it was to give the running backs and the offensive line in a plus I gave the defensive line an a plus in the second quarter. So, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we were texting each other saying that Toby was going to be defensive MVP uh, at one point in this game, which I ended up going different direction. I think it's probably obvious why, but uh, I mean, Toby was fantastic in this. This may be a uniquely good matchup for him because he's simply better than everybody and he doesn't really have a lot of pass rush moves. Uh, but he was great in this game with his, uh, he had one and a half sacks. He should have had two and a half. Uh, but again, him uh, missing uh, the tackle on that other sack um, resulted in the only explosive play of the day uh, for UT Martin. Um, that's not a knock on Toby. That's just say that's more me complimenting the defense and that the only reason UT Martin got an explosive play um, that actually worked out for them uh, was uh, because of a uh, miscue on our part. It, it wasn't anything they actually did themselves. So it was a banner day for the D line, just as we were hoping lots of rotation. We saw a ton of guys, uh, play on the defensive line. Brendan Mott, I thought, looked really good. I think um, our uh, um, theory that him playing opposite um, a lot of other pass rushers would help him, um, That I think that's ring true so far. He looked pretty good. Um, Ryan Davis, he played a lot. PFF actually graded him as the third best pass rusher of the game uh, for K-State, uh, which I, I was really happy with Ryan Davis. He made some um, – Really nice plays. He had a quarterback hit, a quarterback hurry. Um, and uh, he also had a really nice run stop. I don't think it was a TFL, but it was almost a TFL. It was a no gain, I think. Um, and then Travis Bates. Um, I kind of really liked Travis Bates in this game. He was kind of causing some problems on the inside there. Uh, but we saw a ton of defensive line. I think we saw five nose tackles in this game. We saw probably like uh, eight or nine. Uh, defensive ends in this one, and I was pretty happy with pretty much all of them. So the defensive line gets a very, very, very easy A plus for me, an emphatic A plus even. Yes, <laughs> and another emphatic A plus comes with the linebacking room. I mean, Des Purnell. It if you had one game, like if it was just a one game season. I would probably be picketing picketing for Desmond Purnell to be just Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. 
because whoa <laughs> listen we we knew des was good we knew des has been good this was another gear for him this was him activating the nitrous booster and just destroying worlds and i know yes it's an fcs school but everything that he was doing is stuff that carries over even to fbs levels pursuit angles aggression being decent and knowing where he was at in coverage being tenacious meeting blocks i he was just doing everything right and i it amazed i i looked briefly at the pff grades and i was floored by cuz i don't think that des was in the 90s was he no he wasn't particularly close either he um ended up with a 82 and a half uh overall still an elite grade but that's still no, too low well, yeah it's still like a fan like i think in the 80s is pretty much elite and like 90 plus is like you've had like one of the best games that you're ever gonna have in your entire life uh yeah. but no i i was i was shocked that he didn't get a higher grade than he did but pff is just all over the place anyways especially so, on defense yeah particularly but, at the college level too because there's so much more to do yeah but and that's not to say that, you know, Purnell was the only notable performance. Romaine looked good. Romaine looked like he took another step up from last year from his true freshman season. Austin Moore only played the first half or at least a sparingly in the second half. But in relief, Rex Van Wy looked pretty good as well, who is making that move from Will to Sam linebacker, probably because he has ridiculously long arms and that makes him even better in coverage, which – I mean, you, you could make an argument for it, that being a Sam linebacker skill set. I'm not a defensive coordinator. Joe Klanderman is better at his job than I could ever hope to be. So I'm going to choose to defer to him <laughs> on that. But very, very easy A-plus for the linebackers. Yeah, I was super happy with them as well. Desmond Purnell, uh, that was one of the, I think, best individual defensive performances I've seen um, since the show started. Uh, he was flying all over the field at a um, gear that nobody else was. What impressed me most about him, I think, was how quickly he was diagnosing everything that UT Martin was doing. Um, and I think that comes with a combination of knowing your opponent and being comfortable um, in the defensive scheme. And I think that allows him to just play so much faster and so more freely, which that's a lot of that is an experience thing, but also a lot of it's just that Des, Des Purnell is a really good football player. Uh, that is somehow yet another hit on the um, moving <laughs> safeties to linebackers uh, um, pipeline for K-State. Uh, I think there's only been one miss there, uh, but I was really happy with Purnell. Rex fan, why? He actually was graded out higher on PFF than does Purnell. He got 84.5, and his run defense grade was 89.4, so pushing that 90 range. Uh, but you know, the linebackers were just excellent in this game. In fact, the highest graded player in this game uh, was a linebacker. It was not does Purnell or Rex fan, why? I mean, so if you looked at the PFF grades, if you haven't, I, that's I, great because I want you to guess. I looked briefly, um, but I looked – like I said, I looked very briefly. But so it isn't dead. Man. So, not, sorry, repeat. You cut out. Oh, it's sorry. Um, so it's neither Van Wy nor Dez. Correct. I'm guessing it's not more. No, it's not more. Is it Bo? No, it is not. It is Gavin Myers who played <laughs> six total snaps and got an 85.9 uh, defensive grade. So, uh, word? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gavin Myers, the uh, uh, former nearly scholarship ad for Nebraska turned K State walk on. Uh, Highest graded guy on defense, uh, but I I just thought that was interesting and wanted to share. But Bo Palmer was also graded really highly. 
remain too. I mean, there really wasn't a linebacker I can say that played that I was like truly dissatisfed with. No. Um, and, and if there was, it wasn't someone that played enough to really like warrant like dumping. Yeah. So, uh, linebackers across the board, fantastic. Uh, and this one, Marenko, uh, I'm wondering uh, what uh, his return will mean because it's sounding like it was injury that held him out of this one because he wasn't dressed uh, for the game. So neither was Asa. Yeah, and Asa was not either. So that's linebacker room was fantastic, and that was at not full strength. Uh, so like like Rex Van Y, like that's a third level guy, maybe second level guy. Uh, how about uh, Cam Salas coming in and getting a, a huge sack? Uh, he wasn't even on the. Uh, I think he was like the third string, or not even on the depth chart. I don't think he was on the two deep. Yeah, so he um, steps up uh, with some injuries in front of him and comes up with a, a splash play in garbage time. So the linebackers right now are playing uh, on fire. So easy A plus here. Yeah. Now moving into the defensive backs, this is the only room in the defense, spoilers, that isn't going to get an A plus for me. Now you may be asking yourself why. They only got 98 yards passing. Uh, the main reason why is that because it probably should have been about 150 yards passing, mostly because of two really, really bad busts in coverage that other teams would have taken advantage of, and UT Martin very nearly did take advantage of after a very, very rare drop by Devontae Tanksley bailing them out. Um, and, you know, it, it's early season. It's communication errors. That stuff happens. But I'm also very, very scarred by the MU game in the beginning of that. So is this a biased just A? Yes. But, again, it's one of those where I don't think it's anything fundamentally wrong. Because you could see on both plays, it was Siegel and Riley talking to one another. I think it was both plays. It was like, hey, this is the trade-off here. And the other one was like, yeah, okay, yeah, I got you. That's on me. But – for what actually happened, it's probably worth an A+. Plus, but for what should have probably happened, that's where it knocks it down to A. I seriously toyed with not giving them an A+. Plus. I did. Uh, but I, I was pretty tempted to give them an A as well. Um, and in fact, I almost did right up until we started the show. I changed it. Uh, the main reason was that even though Siegel and Riley um, – particularly Riley did have some issues in coverage there. Uh, um, Riley was still really good in run support, um, as was Marquis Siegel. Uh, uh, they really, really impressed with them. Um, then uh, we saw a lot of corners in this game too. Um, Jacob Parrish made a huge uh, run defense stop a, or a, a stop on a screen, I think it was. He was the only guy home, and uh, it would have been a first down, but he um, – is able to get through everybody, um, make a huge tackle in space. Uh, so I was really happy with that. Um, Garber, um, he uh, got targeted three times, only gave up one catch, uh, according to PFF. Um, and we saw a ton of corners. We saw some Jordan Dunbar as well. Uh, he wears number 34, uh, which is kind of a, a weird number uh, for a corner, I feel like. But uh, he... Um, now I know who that is because I was very confused my I saw it for the first time. I was like, is that just some random walk-on or something? But yeah, Just some guy. And Donovan McIntosh, he uh, played a handful of uh, snaps um, outside of garbage time as well. Uh, so that was pretty good to see. And Justice James, he was playing pretty regularly as well. Fabris was good. Wesley Fair, um, I liked. Uh, really, the only major issue was uh, those um, trade-offs um, the communication between Riley and Siegel. BJ Payne uh, was uh, kind of um, unnoticeable in this game. Uh, he only got targeted once, and it was a six-yard uh, reception. So, oh well. Um, <laughs> only had one tackle on this one, so I can't remember much of what he did. Uh, he wasn't super noticeable in the rewatch. The other two starters were a little bit more noticeable for bad reasons, so I'm going to take that from BJ. Uh, but still, I mean, they were 
a whole defensive backfield seemed to be tackling really, really well. So as, since I was a little harder on other positions in this one, as a, a sweet treat to the defensive backs, I decided to let them keep their A+, plus, even though I think it would have been totally fair to give them an A or an A- minus in this one. I'm just being very nice to them because I, I feel like they earned it because I like them. Yeah, that's fair. I'm not going to argue with that. In the vibes-based A+, plus, that's good. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, again, really easy A+, plus for the defensive coordinator. Kleinerman gets an A+. Plus. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got 20 pressures in this game. Uh, Toby Osamsami got six pressures on his own uh, in 16 16- I think is what it was. Uh, so, oh, and yeah, that's six pressures in 10 pass rush reps for Toby Osinsami, which 60% pressure rate, which is a little what? bit nuts. <laughs> uh, so he, he definitely should have gotten more sacks than he did. Uh, not to not trying to complain or, or sound like I'm a, I'm like not grateful or something for uh, for Tobios and Somni here. Uh, but yeah, win rate of 50%, uh, pretty good, um, I have to say. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy uh, with how pretty much the entire defense played and those issues on the back end. Kleinerman's the safeties coach as well as DC, and Kleinman is the head coach, uh, and he was a safety in college or defensive backs coach for a long time. So we'll be just fine on the back end. Yeah. I'm not worried. No. So I, I now we can go into offensive and defensive MVPs before we go into final thoughts to me. Um, do you want to go first for picking your offensive or defensive MVP? Um, I'll go ahead and pick offense first. Okay. So go ahead. I'm rolling with DJ. Uh, I, I think that this was a, I think honestly it wouldn't really mattered which one I went first on. Cause I think there's two obvious picks this week, but I'm rolling with DJ for offense. We already talked about him plenty. So refrain. Yeah. As tempting as it is to give it to the entire offensive line, I am probably going to give it to Dylan Edwards just with how much he did with his, with so few opportunities though, like, like the objectively correct answer is the offensive line. <laughs> But in terms of defensive MVP, I feel like you and I are going to come to a consensus here because although Toby Osinsami did have a ridiculous week, there there was there is another, and that is Des Purnell with probably the best defensive performance that you and I have seen since the Felix Six Sack game. Yeah, I I think you're right there. Um, I am super 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 happy. Uh, with how Des Purnell played, um, well exceeded my already high expectations for him. Uh, so a f- extraordinarily easy MVP for Des Purnell. When for a while it seemed like Toby Osinsami was going to run away with it, uh, but Des Purnell was just so good throughout the whole game. Yeah. Plus he was on the field more. So I mean, basically cheating. It's basically cheating. <laughs> accuracy by volume of fire, but. So now we can get into our, our more general takeaways, which, you know, we talked a little bit about during each of uh, the game day grade segment, but I walked away very pleasantly surprised with Riley. Everything else except for Avery pretty much met my expectations. And any time that Avery didn't meet expectations, I just thought to myself, okay, this is his second start of his career. No, we're not counting him in Wildcat up against TCU. That doesn't count. But I, it's all correctable, and it's all stuff that's, I don't want to say easily corrected, but it's not like you have to completely rework his throwing motion or completely rework how he's going through his progressions. It It's just small stuff and waiting for the game to slow down for him. So my number one takeaway is the takeaway I opened the the entire show with is people need to relax a lot. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, that's a great takeaway. Um, my main one is I think this team is pretty much exactly what the coaches told us it would be. Uh, if you read between the lines uh, throughout uh, fall camp, uh, there was a ton of talk about how the offense was really great, uh, but it was the defense that uh, was truly special. And the rumblings were always that the defense was going to really be the uh, – uh, this was like – like in contention for one of the best defenses in Kleiman's time here, maybe the best. And I think that really rings true after one game. Uh, we'll see if that remains true uh, in regards to right now, the separation between the defense and offense, but the offense has the tools to catch up. Uh, they may not have the experience to do so, uh, but the pieces are there. Um, and all in all, I'm, I'm not really dismayed by this game at all. Um, Really looking forward to continuing this season. I'm excited for the next game. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it's just the immediately afterwards, the game panicking, but that's pretty much all I have in terms of, of thoughts. So do you have any, do you want to double up before we, we sign off here? I've got nothing else, man. All right. Well, we will talk to you all then with the two lane preview. But for now, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. If you want to follow or contact the show, you can follow us just about anywhere at Aggieville A Cats. And if you want to email us, we're Aggieville Alley Cats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at AC Edwards 00. I am at Connor Bouncer, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store or a supporters link both in our podcast and Twitter bios. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news you so love. Stay safe, Alley Cats.